here. Welcome everyone to GLR Learning Tuesdays. Um, we will get started at the top of the hour. As we're gathering, we encourage you to start the conversation or share any um, remarks that you might have on social media. You'll see our handles for Twitter and um, our page on Facebook here, um, and then our hashtags, which are GL Reading and hashtag Learning Tuesdays. joining us for today's GLR Learning Tuesdays webinar, Prioritizing the Parent-Teacher Relationship, Lessons Learned from 50 Years of Research and Practice. My name is Sarah Torian, and I'm a consultant with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading, and I'm helping to coordinate this series of online learning events. But before we get started, I'd like to go over a couple of quick housekeeping details. First, I'd encourage you to use the chat box function to introduce yourself, sharing your name, organization, and the name of the GLR coalition that you're a member of, if you're a member of one. Um, I'd also like to note that we, you are all in listen-only mode to avoid any background noises and distractions during the presentation. Um, when we transition to Q&A, you may raise your hand if you'd like to be unmuted to ask a question, but we also encourage your engagement throughout the webinar and welcome you to be posting any questions that, you may, that may come to you during the presentations in the chat box. And our moderator will share them with the presenters as we transition into Q&A. In addition, I'd just like to share that today's webinar is being recorded and a link to that recording will be shared with all who registered for today's conversation. Um, I'd also like to give you a quick heads up that we'll be posting a brief survey poll after the presentations are over to elicit your feedback on today's webinar and to help us ensure that these online learning events are really meeting your learning needs. And now I'd like to share just a little bit of background information about GLR Learning Tuesdays. We have a number of great sessions planned for the coming weeks, always on Tuesday and always starting at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. We're hoping that this predictable and reliable schedule will make it easier for you and others to make plans to join in for this robust series of online learning opportunities. We've already hosted nine webinars since the launch of GLR Learning Tuesdays in September, and I'd encourage you to visit CLIP to find the growing archive of resources from these online conversations, exploring the science, emerging models, and work of leaders in this field. And I hope that you'll continue to save this date and time and make plans to join in for more of these great learning events. For today's webinar, as I mentioned earlier, we'll be exploring the importance of strong partnerships between parents and teachers. And for that conversation, we're very fortunate to have Ginger Young join us today as the moderator. Ginger is the founder and executive director of Book Harvest in Durham, North Carolina, and also serves as a leader in the community-wide effort there to support birth through third grade literacy. So welcome, Ginger, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sarah, mm -hmm. and hello, everybody. I am so glad to be in this community with everybody as we talk about a really important topic in, in our world. Uh, I think we're ready to go. Um, as Sarah said, GLR Learning Tuesdays continues today with the second in the Productive Parent-Teacher Partnerships webinar series. Supported by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, this series builds on what we all know from research, experience, and common sense. Strong, positive relationships between parents and their child's teachers are essential to student success. This series is, is designed to encourage stakeholders in prioritizing, investing in, and supporting a blended model approach that promotes strong, positive relationships between parents and teachers. The first webinar in the Productive Parent-Teacher Partnership series was entitled, The Essential Ingredients of Building a Productive Parent-Teacher Partnership, and it brought together Dr. Karen Mapp, a senior lecturer at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and the author of the Dual Capacity Framework, and Kristen Airgood, CEO and board chair of the Flamboyant Foundation, for a lively discussion. 
You can find this archived webinar recording and slide deck on CLIP, along with a lot of other archived resources for our community. Today's GLR webinar, Learning Tuesday webinar, as Sarah mentioned, is called Prioritizing the Parent-Teacher Relationship, Lessons from 50 Years of Research and Practice. And we are honored today to have a trio of experts with us, whom I'm delighted to introduce now. First, we have Helen Westmoreland. Helen is the Director of Family Engagement for National PTA. The Center for Family Engagement aims to empower grassroots parent leaders to demand more transformative approaches to how families and schools work together so that PTAs and parents can model and champion more equitable and effective programs and policies for family school partnerships. Helen's earlier career included stints at the Flamboyant Foundation and the Global Family Research Project. Next up is David Park, the Senior Vice President for Strategy and Communications at Learning Heroes, an organization that supports parents as their children's most effective education advocates through research-based information and resources. Prior to Learning Heroes, David helped shape and lead the Grad Nation campaign at America's Promise Alliance. Also with us today is Quasi Rollins, the Vice President for Leadership and Engagement at the Institution, Institute for Educational Leadership. Quasi guides the IEL's portfolio of programs designed to develop and support leaders with an emphasis on family and community engagement, early childhood education, and community-based leadership development. So we're going to start with you, Helen, and look at the research around parent-teacher relationships. Helen, from where you sit at the National PTA, what highlights can you share about the research on parent-teacher partnerships over the past 50 years? What have we learned, and where is the research taking us? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ginger, and thank you to the Campaign for Grade Level Reading for having me here today. I'm really excited to share uh, some of the research um, that we've been using to shape our work here at National PTA with you all about the importance of the parent-teacher partnership. Um, first, I want to just tell you my why. I think our whys drive a lot of our, our lens in this work. Um, I started my career uh, nearly 20 years ago, also in fabulous Durham, North Carolina, um, in a room full of parents in community-based after-school programs who were hungry for help better connecting to their children's uh, schools and specifically their teachers. Um, and so I've spent uh, a number of years in sort of different roles examining that and advocating for that. Um, and I had the great pleasure of being part of the kitchen cabinet with Campaign for Grade Level Reading, gosh, nearly 10 years ago now. Um, so it's incredible to see this evolution um, and I'm grateful to be a, a very, very small part of it. So um, let me tell you just a little bit about uh, National PTA Center for Family Engagement. We're a relatively new initiative. Um, although family engagement is part and parcel of the work of PTA, um, we've recognized that there's more we can and should do. Um, so I was brought on board to help us figure out our unique niche in this work and build our roadmap for what it will look like for us in the future. So as Ginger mentioned, our purpose is to embed family engagement across the educational system, um, and we are doing that through a real grassroots approach. Um, we are first and foremost an advocacy organization of over 3 million members in 24,000 schools uh, across the country um, that are led by volunteer parent and teacher leaders at the national, state, district, and local levels. So we believe very strongly that it, all parents want the best for their children and that it's our job to both model what great family engagement looks like and also push for more effective and equitable approaches to family engagement at all these levels of the system. So let me talk about what the future looks like for us as we envision it. Um, I mentioned equity and effectiveness. Um, and this is at the heart of what we mean when I say transformative family engagement. I want to give you a little bit of a sense of how the parent-teacher partnership fits in our overall strategy um, before I unpack the research a little bit for you. So you have heard and will continue to hear from a lot of wonderful folks in the field about different frameworks for family engagement, parent success, parent-teacher partnerships. And I want to encourage you all um, to do your own work about what this really means for you in your own context through the lens of your own values. For us at PTA, we co-constructed our approach to family engagement with nearly 300 stakeholders 
um, focusing on parent and teacher leaders within the association, um, as well as great outside experts, including both of my illustrious colleagues who will be sharing on the webinar today. Um, about you know what would you want to see in PTA and in the world if we were to describe family engagement in the future. That coupled with the research review I'm going to share with you uh, the highlights of in a little bit brought us to what we call the four I's of transformative family engagement. So first and foremost um, we believe that robust family engagement approaches are inclusive where we're evaluating and embracing diverse perspectives we also believe that they're individualized to meet the needs of all families and children, recognizing that there's no one size fits all to how we do this work. Um, third, and where the bulk of my presentation will focus today, we believe that effective family engagement approaches are integrated into the educational system, where families and educators are working together side by side. And lastly, um, in our view, family engagement when it's transformative is impactful. So we're no longer doing those sit and gets, we're interactive, we are capacity focused um, to be sure everybody is at the table um, and able to engage. So um, very quickly what this looks like in our day-to-day -day practice and our strategy at the Center for Family Engagement is we are working to build awareness and knowledge um, across PTA about what transformative look, family engagement looks like in action. Second, we're catalyzing leaders within our association to move this work forward at multiple levels, as I mentioned, through grants, leadership development initiatives um, that encourage more intentional listening, partnership building, and action. Third, we're elevating the voice of parents and conversations and decisions about family engagement by amplifying meaningful research, like you'll hear later um, on in this presentation from some of my colleagues, um, as well as by conducting our own participatory action research in the ground. And lastly, like all of us, we're looking to be sure we're sustainable and effective in how we do this work. And across all of it, parent-teacher partnerships are central to our strategy. Um, we are the parent-teacher association, after all. Um, so let me shift to the meat and potatoes of today's presentation to talk to you about what we've learned from research on parent-teacher partnerships over the past 50 years. So parent-teacher partnerships have been a focus of educational research for a really long time. Um, this field has been formed by a number of sub-disciplines, so uh, particularly a strong, robust field of research around early childhood and school transition practices, but also anthropology and sociology research, uh, school improvement research, psychology and psychometrics, and even most recently, uh, more research on behavioral economics. So four main questions undergirded what we know today about parent-teacher partnerships. First, there's been a long history of exploring families and educators' experiences of family engagement. So in 1950, which I know is technically outside our 50-year window, um, but Louis Kaplan wrote pretty extensively about tensions in parent-teacher partnerships. And he identified three tensions in that relationship. So first was there was often disagreement or misunderstanding about the school program. Two, the efforts of parents and teachers were often in their own self-interest to protect their roles and their own egos. And third, there were personal inadequacies in skills, knowledge, trust. Um, so a lot of that is still true today, and you're going to hear more about how organizations like Learning Heroes are really pushing our understanding to further explore some of the perceptions of families. Um, so they're a centerpiece, not an afterthought of our educational system. In the past three decades, there's been a lot more research around these second two interrelated questions, how family school partnerships affect student outcomes, and then the impact of specific interventions that are designed to improve the parent-teacher partnership. These studies have looked at a range of outcomes, which has broadened over time. So starting very centrally around that student achievement measure, expanding to grades, to attendance in schools, even student characteristics like social skills and self-efficacy. And more so over the past decade or two, that research has also looked at the important benefits of parent-teacher partnerships for families, communities, and the educators themselves that are part of those partnerships. And then lastly, in the past decade, there's been growing agreement for the need for more systematic approaches to parent-teacher partnerships which has spurred a research interest around how we can leverage low-cost changes in behavior for larger-scale change. 
So this research tends to evaluate the use of technology um, and the sharing of relevant and often personalized information with families, often through experimental designs. So from these 50 years of research and big questions, what do we know about the parent-teacher partnership? I'm going to give you sort of three big buckets of headlines um, today. Um, the first is around the impact of the parent-teacher partnership. The second is around how parent-teacher partnerships influence equity issues. And then I'm going to give you a little bit of specifics about what good parent-teacher partnerships look like in practice. So let's start with the impact. So first, I want to dispel any, any uh, perhaps skepticism amongst this highly engaged group that parent-teacher partnerships might not matter. They very much matter, and there's a really robust body of evidence that shows they do, um, first and foremost around the importance of parent-teacher partnerships for student outcomes. So one study I would elevate um, in this mix is a study by Westat and Policy Associates from 2001 that looked at Gosh, it was of 71 uh, Title I schools and how they improved over time. And they looked at different sort of policy levers at the time that were really popular and found that um, parent and teacher uh, connection and specifically teacher outreach to parents um, through face-to-face -face meetings, calling home, sending materials home, um, was associated with 50% higher achievement gains in reading growth from third to fifth grade and 40% higher achievement gains in math growth from third to fifth grade. And just to put this in a little bit of perspective, for the lowest achieving students that entered third grade, the effect size of this teacher outreach was almost three times as impactful as what said was the best, best professional development they ever got of their life, right? So huge impacts from really um, relatively minor but significant um, outreach practices by teachers. And we see this across populations, some really interesting recent research from Phyllis McGuire and Peter Cohen on middle schoolers in Native American populations has also found that the strength of that family-teacher partnership has really benefits for how students see themselves um, and their own relationship to their cultural identity. So second, we often focus on the student, there's sometimes a family in the research on this work, um, but we also know that parent-teacher partnerships matter for the educators themselves. Um, research shows that it helps them feel much more efficacious in their job. Um, and you may be familiar, if you're not, I encourage you to get the book with the um, seminal study by Tony Bright and Barbara Schneider called Trust in Schools, which found that parent-teacher trust had a really direct correlation to overall trust within the school climate, including how teachers interacted with one another professionally. So lastly, um, and perhaps what hinges all of this work together, um, is that teacher outreach to families predicts if and how they engage. So you'll often in casual conversation hear people say, you know, the involved parent or the uninvolved parent. And this is a really misleading terminology because how parents engage with their kids' education is totally subject to change. Um, it's not static. Multiple variables affect this. Um, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a deeper dive into this with some really important research um, that Kathy Hoover Dempsey and her team um, have done at um, Vanderbilt University. So for those of you who love a logic model, here it is. Here's a great logic model for you. Um, so Kathy Hoover Dempsey has done some great work on what predicts family engagement. I'm going to start from the right side and work backwards a little bit. So it's not a very difficult leap to say that student achievement is predicted by a lot of student beliefs about themselves um, and the abilities in sort of a whole child education lens of the work. These student attitudes are predicted by how kids perceive their families are involved in their education. Um, and you see a number in the green column here of positive ones. You could probably imagine the flip side of those um, if they perceive their family's engagement is not so positively. Their perceptions are influenced by how parents actually are involved at home and at school. And what this model shows us that is really significant is what it is that predicts those behaviors on parents' part. And the researchers have found three big buckets of work. So the first is parents' motivational beliefs, so how they see their job and whether they think their involvement is going to make a difference in their kids' education. 
The second is around invitations, and I want to call out here that very specifically teachers' invitations to parents predict their involvement patterns. And then third is their life context. So do they feel like they have the time to be engaged? Do they feel confident and like they have the skills to be engaged? So across this model, we can see that there's an influence of teachers, and I also want to call it that there's an influence of kids in how we understand the parent-teacher partnership. So next, let's take a quick look at some of the equity implications of the parent-teacher partnership. Um, so first, research tells us um, what many of us know in our day-to-day, -day, whether as parents ourselves um, in our, or in our own work with families. Ginger, can I get you to go to the next slide for me? Um, that is that not all families engage in the same way. For example, a number of studies have shown that families of color and low-income families are more likely to place a higher emphasis on home-based forms of involvement than necessarily school-based forms of involvement, particularly compared to the more affluent and white peers. Um, this is due both to values as well as to logistical and cultural barriers of actually physically being involved at school versus some of the other ways a parent may choose to be involved, which may be invisible to those inside schools. So, however, do our expectations mirror this research? Uh, families are involved in lots of different ways. Not really. Um, so, typically, we see schools and educators place a really high value on involvement in the most physical sense at schools. Um, it's no surprise, then, that the system is often biased against families who may exercise other forms of engagement at home. So, for example, researchers at Texas A&M found that teachers report the relationship quality with white families and, to a lesser extent, Hispanic families more positively than they do with African-American families. And after controlling for student performance as well as the actual aptitude of students, they find that those teachers' self-reported status of a relationship was very predictive of their expectations of kids, whether they thought the kids in their class could achieve or might not achieve, and we know that those expectations um, really have a, uh, an important impact on students' overall performance later on. The good news is that this, is, this family-teacher relationship can counteract these biases that educators may hold about families and the inequities of our system. So, for example, a study by Stephanie Rowley and her colleagues found that memories of racial discrimination cause mothers to engage less if their relationship with their teacher is weak, um, but more if their relationship with their teacher is strong. So just that strong parent-teacher relationship can mitigate some of those experiences of discrimination that many families um, have had with our educational system. And next month, you'll hear from Gina Martinez-Teddy of the parent-teacher home visits um, about some of their work, including evaluation that's shown some really interesting implications for how we can build relationships and mitigate against bias. So I want to do a little thought experiment because I know people's eyes can glaze over when we say research. <laughs> so um, I mentioned that family engagement often differs across demographic lines. Can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, uh, Keith Robinson um, and his colleague did some work a couple of years ago. You may remember this headline. It was a much less flattering headline in the New York Times. I think it said family engagement is overrated. But they looked at all the different forms of engagement, I think over 40 different forms of engagement across differences of race, class, uh, socioeconomic status, language. Um, and so we want to give you that same thought experiment that they did over years and years of research. Could you pop up the question for us, Ginger? I think it's probably just the, oh, keep going. Sorry, I don't know why I did that. One more. Great. So across age groups, one of these four forms of family engagement had a consistently positive impact on students' achievement and attendance in school. And we want to hear from you in the chat box. What do you think it was? So we got a reading to your child, attending a parent-teacher conference, someone thinks. Some more reading from your child. OK. Ooh, lots of reading with your child. I'm not surprised, given the incredible emphasis on reading here. I'm going to burst some of your bubbles. 
across lines of difference, the most consistent thing a parent could do for their child was request a specific teacher. So we know that this parent-teacher relationship is impactful not just for some parents, but for all parents. Now, will we go out and say, I mean, our schools would all kill us. We say we're going to get every family mobilized to request a specific teacher. But I think it gives us a really interesting window to think about what it is we're encouraging and how we set our system up to do so. So lastly, before I turn it over to my um, colleagues, I want to talk a little bit about just some of the implementation research and what that's showing us. Um, so there are some specific things we've learned in the research that do make a difference um, when it comes to the parent-teacher partnership. So the first is around personalized learning-focused outreach. Um, so we know particularly from some of the work recently from the Student Social Support Lab that some things like the personalized text message over the summer, giving your family an idea for improvement, have really significant benefits, um, both in predicting kids' uh, completion of course credits and reducing dropouts. Frequency is also something that goes both ways in the research. Um, some have found it positively associated with outcomes. Some would argue that frequency is not what matters. It's the actual content of the outreach between parents and teachers that matter most. Relationship building home visits is something that's been shown to have an impact across multiple different populations, and you'll hear more about that in this webinar series. Positive communication in the form of praise notes and other things home teacher-led workshops for families, and then teacher invitations to volunteer. Um, and so the last piece of implementation research I want to share with you all um, is that despite the fact we know that there are many ways that parent and teacher connection and communication matter for student outcomes, um, we are still hearing from educators across the country that they want help. So um, specifically, there have been some great surveys that have been done by Scholastic. MetLife did one over 10 years ago that sort of mirrored these same findings that show that teachers are asking for help. They rate family engagement as a really um, important, if not the most important, challenge in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and I would also encourage you all to look at Susan Sheridan and Tyler Smith's work, who recently did a meta-analysis of teacher training programs and found that both pre-service and in-service teacher training around family engagement had some really important benefits. So I'm not going to say a lot on this last slide about um, implementation help because my colleagues are going to speak to this. Um, there's important disconnects between what we want and what happens in reality when it comes to the parent-teacher partnership. Um, so I just want to point you to a couple of additional resources um, in case you're interested in them. So first, in 1997, um, Global Family Research Project released its new skills for new schools, um, which offered policy and practice recommendations for improving teacher preparation around family engagement. That was updated in 2011. Um, they were initially scheduled to help out with this webinar and couldn't make it, but that is an incredible research I want to um, point you all to. We partnered with them to turn some of the Carnegie Challenge paper they worked on the next generation of family engagement into a parent-friendly resource um, that parents can use to advocate for more transformative family engagement approaches in their community. Um, and so with that, we sort of come full circle from uh, what the Center for Family Engagement is designed to do in our strategy to the research and back. Um, so if you could go to the last slide, please, Ginger. I want to encourage you all, if you have further questions on the research or the Center for Family Engagement, please feel free to reach out to me here. And I want to make a quick plug um, for uh, Notes from the Backpack, our new podcast, which is all about giving families the inside scoop on how to support their child's learning and how to advocate for those family engagement practices in their own communities. We have um, an episode that breaks down some of Learning Heroes great work for that parent audience, um, as well as Quasi is going to talk to us, talk about the myth of the uninvolved parent on this series, and we really hope you will tune in and hope to hear from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Helen. That was just a content-rich and very thought-provoking uh, set of uh, slides and concepts. Um, and now we're going to look a little more deeply at the voices of parents with David. David, you spend a lot of time at Learning Heroes listening to parents in both understanding and sharing their perspectives. What are the trends you are observing? What are your big takeaways over the past few years about what parents think and what they need to be effective at engaging with teachers in schools? 
Thank you uh, so much uh, to the campaign for grade level reading, and thank you, Ginger, for driving this so brilliantly. Um, Helen's always a tough act to follow. Um, I always love hearing about the work of the Center for Family Engagement. I was there at the very beginning, and she's just really, with the team there at National PTA, done an amazing job and made a huge contribution to the field um, and continues to. We've worked with National PTA for five years since Learning Heroes launched five years ago. They were our first partner and, and continue to work really closely with them and learn a lot from them. Um, so I hope to build off of Helen's presentation just a little bit um, and, and as, as Ginger kind of framed this conversation, just really kind of taking a close look at some of the trends specifically that we've We've, um, we've seen in the last four years um, from some of our qualitative and quantitative research, and there are some pretty startling insights um, that I believe can really help the field um, in, in all of us who are working very closely with parents and, and, and teachers and specifically po focused on this important parent and teacher partnership. Um, so moving ahead to the next slide, so a little bit first, um, because Learning Heroes is a relatively new organization, and so some of you may not be familiar with us. Um, and so we believe strongly that every parent is their child's learning hero, and with the right support, their engagement can not only have a significant impact on their child's education, but also can really help drive overall school improvement, can drive changes, effective and important changes in, in schools and systems. Um, and so, but in order for that to happen, um, we strongly believe that every parent needs to have a clear and accurate picture of their child's achievement, um, both academically and developmentally. And that's our mission and that's what we really think about every single day. And so from the beginning, we've, we've really kind of taken uh, an approach of listening to parents to the support of Carnegie Corporation of New York and a lot of um, other organizations. We have been able to to listen to, to parents and guardians and families and teachers to better understand their mindsets, kind of what um, they think in terms of their child's education, um, what they know, what they believe, their hopes and their dreams, and we've learned a ton. And the reason that we do this research is not only so that we can develop tools and resources and materials and information for parents, which is incredibly important, but also it's because we want to share it with the field. Um, this is not research for us, it's research for the field and we really hope that you'll take advantage of it. Um, we do have all of our research published on our website at BeALearningHero.org um, and my contact information is at the end of the presentation, so feel free to, to uh, reach out to me. Um, so, so this slide here is really important and it kind of showcases how parents have a false sense of security um, with their child's education. Um, and so if you look at the left and that 90%, this is something that we discovered through our research four years ago in 2016 for the first time. And believe it or not, it has been consistent every year since then that 90% of parents, and this is regardless of race or income or education level, believe that their child is at or above grade level in reading and math. So nine in 10 parents think that their child is really just doing fine, doing well in school, in reading and math. Um, and I think most of, of you on, on this webinar kind of know that, that unfortunately um, a lot of kids really aren't doing, aren't doing as, as, as well as they could be and as well as they need to be. Um, and in fact, when you look at the most recent NAVE scores, 35% of students nationally perform at or above grade level. So we look at that kind of disconnect between 90% perception of how our kids are doing and the reality of only 35% of students nationally, all students, being able to perform at or above grade level work. And unfortunately, when you look at kind of most, our most underserved students, um, that, that, that disconnect is even greater. And then you look at the 39%, that's a, that's a percentage of teachers, and this is a scholastic study from 2016, um, which is that 39% of teachers um, uh, believe that their students come to the classroom prepared for grade level work. And so really there's this a huge disconnect. And that we were blown away by 
um, we, could, we probably would have guessed maybe 60, 70 percent at the most of parents who believe their child is at or above grade level, but 90 percent, um, that's really shaped and fueled a lot of the work that we do at Learning Heroes, um, specifically with our, our partner organizations that we work so closely with. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, I guess the natural, the natural next question is why this disconnect and why is this perception of achievement so far off from reality? Um, and when you look at this, and again this is based on our, our national surveys from the past four years, the vast majority, 74% of parents are indicating that their kids are getting mostly A's and B's, either all A's or mostly A's and B's on their report cards. Um, so nearly three-fourths of parents say that their children, and this is consistent with uh, TNTP's data, um, three-fourths of, of parents are really saying that their, their kids are getting very good grades on their report cards. And not surprisingly, more than eight in 10 or 84% of parents um, believe that good grades equals grade level. So because they're getting A's and B's, yeah, they're, they're, they must be on grade level. They must be doing really well. Um, but let's take a look now at what teachers think about report cards. And so, and this is where it gets uh, a little more interesting even. Um, so the statistic isn't on this slide, but 89% of parents say they rely on report cards, okay, um, to know whether their ch a child is achieving at grade level. Um, but what do teachers think about report cards? Well, nearly half agree that report cards measure effort more than achievement. So report cards are really subjective, they tell us. You know, so they um, incorporate handing in assignments, participating in class, um, just showing up, you know? Um, and, and, and so nearly half of, of teachers say that report cards are measuring effort um, more than achievement. And there's no doubt effort is incredibly important, but it doesn't necessarily mean that a child is performing at grade level. And then also we found that teachers will say that parents are too focused on report cards alone. 64% said that parents are focused too much on report cards to understand their child's achievement. Um, so going on to the next slide, uh, so what are the most important ways to understand your child's achievement? Well, that likely depends on who you ask, and you can see the differences uh, between uh, the responses from teachers and the responses from parents. So teachers, um, and, and this is what Helen kind of hinted at at the end of her presentation, um, teachers say that the most important way to understand how your child is achieving is to have regular communication with a teacher. You know, and report cards come in third after graded tests and, and quizzes from the class. And the number one way parents say they know how, um, or say how they assess their child's achievement is through report cards. So you look at the difference there. Parents saying report cards, that's how I tell how my child is doing. Um, teachers don't disagree, but it's kind of rated kind of much, much lower you know, and they, they rate communication and ongoing communication with the teacher as the most important way to understand achievement. You look, if you look at regular communication with the teacher from the parent perspective, that's down at number five. So it's pretty far down. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, what, while teachers say that the number one way for parents to understand, as we just said, um, their ch children's achievement, they also tell us that it's not a job expectation. You know, and sometimes they put the onus on the parent to communicate with the teacher. So as you see from these graphs, teachers are more likely to communicate with parents in elementary school than in middle school, and a bit more likely to communicate with parents in middle school than they are in high school on important issues, such as alerting parents when their children are struggling academically. And from the parent perspective, no news is good news. If they aren't hearing from the teacher that there's an issue, um, there must not be an issue. Um, so from our perspective, if this communication isn't happening to the degree that it should, this regular ongoing communication between the parent and the child and the teacher, 
Uh, we need to build some ways in. The field needs to really kind of think hard about how we can build ways in to foster ongoing communication um, where it's not happening to the degree that it should be between the parent, the student, and, um, and the teacher. So on the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about um, resources that parents find helpful at each uh, stage of their child's development. And the good news is that parents welcome the help at each stage of a child's education. Um, so from 71% to 81% of parents say a simple and understandable explanation of what their child is expected to learn each year would be extremely or very helpful or a simple way to determine if their child is ready for classwork in the next year, or tips to advocate for their child. Parents want and need resources, and you can see that that's the case in elementary school, in middle school, and in high school. Um, so going on to the, the next slide, you know, on our website, um, BeALearningHero.org, uh, we curate tools and resources from a lot of our partner organizations. And when we see that there's a gap, we create resources uh, ourselves based on this research. So now I'm going to give you a few examples of tools that we've created to help foster communication between parent and student and teacher um, to make sure that parents have a more accurate picture of their child's achievement. And we employ what we call a surround sound approach. So we use a, a variety of methods. Um, online and offline uh, to, to reach parents effectively. Um, and so first, there, we do three seasonal campaigns, and we, do, um, we work very closely with, uh, with National PTA as well as Univision and Unidos US, uh, National Urban League, and other groups to, to promote these resources and to, get, to make sure that they get into the hands of parents. So these um, seasonal campaigns have actionable information and resources during key points of the year. Um, so our Spring Ahead campaign, which is at the beginning of the year, helps parents prepare for their child for the annual state test um, and, and, and shows them that it's really kind of one of several measures um, that can help them assess their child's achievement. And then we have a summer, a summer stride resource. We have a back to school resource. Um, that really helps parents start the year off strong and lay the foundation for partnering with their, their child's new teacher. So then we have the Learning Hero Roadmap, which is an interactive guide with tools and resources to help parents support their child's social, emotional, and academic development. And the newest addition to this, this guide is called the Readiness Check, which I'll talk to you about in just a second. And finally, we provide technical assistance. So we provide TA and share our research insights on communicating directly with parents um, to um, SEAs and LEAs and various organizations across the country. Um, so, on the next slide, you'll see a couple of examples of some of the tools and resources that I'm talking about, just to give you a sense of what they, what they look like. To the left is our ESSA compliant school report card template um, that's being uh, used in, in several states. Um, and then the right is the image of the three seasonal campaigns. And these are all in multimedia formats so that they can be uh, available, um, whether digitally or kind of as part of your ongoing parent engagement work. These are all free resources. We provide them free of, of charge, our communications, and, and they're all bilingual. Um, so if you're interested in co-branding any of the seasonal campaigns, um, just let me know and we'll, we'll certainly be able to do that for you. And the next slide talks a little bit about um, one of our, our recent tools, which is called Puzzle to Plan. And this is an example of how it is designed to strengthen the parent-teacher communication. And it's a simple three-step worksheet that helps parents, teachers, and students create a plan uh, based on grade level progress. So it's really important kind of bringing that student perspective in, the parent perspective, and the teacher perspective all in, in, in one resource and one tool um, because we really want to foster that this is the work of, of all of us together. And it needs to be um, not just one way, but uh, two-way communication. Um, 
Finally, uh, on the next slide, a little bit about our readiness check. It's a, a highly predictive, uh, simple tool based on three to five questions in math and reading, and it's designed to give parents a gut check of whether or not their child is ready for the next, um, the, the current school year. So it's three to five questions in reading and math, um, and it's a gut check on how their child is progressing um, with foundational grade level skills and how they can specifically support these skills at home uh, through various activities. Um, so finally, um, one slide I always like to, to end on uh, because um, it, it really kind of shows that this work is, is achievable. Um, it's at the top, you'll see that the 88% uh, which refers to the current percentage of parents who think that their child is at or above grade level in math. Well, we asked those parents if they still think that their child is at or above grade level um, when we gave them some readily available information. And these were hypotheticals that we presented. And what we, we said was if your child receives a B in math and doesn't meet the expectations on the state test, do you still think that your child is at or above grade level? That 88% then goes to 61%. So just a little bit of readily available information really change, changes parent mindsets. Um, and then, if we take it one step further, added another piece of information, what if your child's school receives an overall performance rating of C, in addition to your child receiving a B in math and not meeting the expectations from the state test? That 61% then goes to 52%. So we've made a difference. Um, from 88% to 52% just based on giving the parent uh, a little more information. And so a little information really does, does go a long way. Again, um, thank you for including Learning Heroes in this, in this webinar, and here is my contact information. Looking forward to continuing a dialogue. Thank you so much, David. Um, there are a couple of questions that will defer to the um, discussion at the end that I've noted that people have put in the chat box. Thank you so much and keep those questions coming. One quick question before we move on, David, that um, that Dolores Argyle asked is, are these resources for parents offered in Spanish? They are, yes. All of our resources are in English and, and Spanish. That's Thank great. You, Thank Brad. you so much. So again, keep those questions coming. There's some good um, good threads being picked up in the chat box and we will return to them. I want to now turn us to Quasi Rollins who is here to talk with us about system ha systems, handoffs, fumbles, and bright spots. And Quasi, in your work um, with the Institute for Educational Leadership, you think hard about the educational systems that parents come in contact with. What are ways in which these systems meet parents where they are and fall short of doing so? And what sorts of systems change is needed to facilitate productive parent-teacher partnerships? So thanks, Ginger. Uh, this has been a really robust conversation, and I, I can't wait till we all get to, to answer some of the questions in the chat. Uh, you know, I think as when I went off camera, I was um, taking a bite to eat because I didn't bring enough food for everybody in class, but I was also uh, writing down a new kind of graph. Uh, as I listened to David's um, conversation, it reminded me that we're in kind of a unique moment because we've got all, we've got 50 years of research, lots of evidence, we've got lots of tools and resources that are available. And now kind of one of the missing pieces and what I hope to talk a lot about is the, the systems and the structures required to kind of deliver all of this, to act on the research um, and to support uh, the adults in doing a better job of supporting their kids. And so that's all of the adults. Um, the parents and families, of course, and then the adults who are in, who are part of the teaching and learning enterprise, you know, all of the educators and all of those support systems. So how do we, how do we deliver all that we know and all that we have and how do we sustain uh, the strategies that are effective? Um, just a little bit of background, not very much. Uh, as you heard, I'm at the Institute for Educational Leadership. Uh, our primary contribution to, to this field in this moment is really to support district leaders. About nine or so years ago, we embarked on a project to create a national network of folks who coordinate family and community engagement at the school district level. And uh, over that time, we now um, have engaged in a number of ways with a couple of hundred school district leaders and their teams. 
Uh, we mostly create convenings, and many of you have been at our National Family Community Engagement Conference. Some of you who are district leaders have come to our learning labs where we um, are hosted by a local member. But our emphasis um, is really on systems, structures, on systemic family and community engagement. Um, and the ways in which we make meaning of all of the research and evidence and really create the kind of systems that can support um, uh, families and how we align a range of kind of strategies that are happening at the school district level uh, in the interest of, of improving outcomes across the board. And so as you can see in my, in my initial graphic, just pictures of lots of different families, kids, cradle to career, you know, our systems support uh, all of this, um, across the board. So it's useful to just kind of go back and revisit in the next slide. I talk a little bit about who are our parents and who are our students. And I'll, and I'll get to that in a minute. And part of this, we're in a, what's also interesting about this moment is that we, we're now at a time where obviously we, we've got some, some basic kind of stereotypes that operate about who parents are. A lot of our students are kids of color for the first time in public schools, over 50% are kids of color, over 50% are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, a number of them, 13% receive special education services or have some kinds of special needs and almost 10% of our kids in public schools are English language learners. And so what that ends up meaning is that um, uh, kids present with a lot of complexity families and we and I'm, I'm going back and forth between slides so that's that's okay um, you don't have to keep going back and forth but we know that all families I think what's interesting about Davis research where families have this perception that all they're they by default believe their babies are doing fine <laughs> even if the even if the reality says different and that's partly a function and an extension of the just the level of caring uh, you know, that all families care and want to see what's best for their kids. They want their kids to succeed. Um, and we don't want to take the fact that 50% of our students are, are eligible for free and reduced lunch to mean that automatically we should have low expectations. In fact, what, what David's research shows is that even though perception is different from reality, part of that perception is a reflection of high expectations and we want to have high expectations for our young people, but then we also want to kind of create and strengthen the systems and structures that will help us meet those high expectations. So that's worth knowing. And if we go to the to the next slide, um, I think it's really it's important to kind of compare and contrast because a lot of uh, a lot of our young people who are experiencing extra challenges are in the set of conditions where it's often tough for them. And so the context for um, engaging families is also tough. Doesn't mean it is impossible, but it means that we've got to really pay attention to our specific uh, context. Um, a lot of our young people are, and their families are have been historically underserved by the institutions that are supposed to support them. And that means that there's sometimes a healthy skepticism of the school district uh, and, and of other systems. Um, a lot of our families are working really hard. They're underemployed or working multiple jobs that don't um, pay a living wage or the wage that they really need to fully support their families. And so it also means that they have a lot less flexibility in their lives. Um, they have a lot less control over their schedules. Some of us are very fortunate to have a, a great deal of control and we can drop everything. My organization had a board meeting today and one of our board members uh, has a child in school and a pipe burst at school and he was able to just pick up and leave and go get his child. Not all of our families have that level of flexibility in their lives or when they do have to do something like that in an emergency, it means that there are other consequences that might have to be paid. Um, some of our families and kids often have less access to high quality early childhood uh, and other education settings, and that's part of the context. Um, and then, of course, schools, as we heard in some of the earlier research, um, our, our teachers and other educators sometimes lack the capacity. It's not that they don't want to engage families, but if part of achieving the goals that we want to achieve and engaging families means building trust and building relationships, then uh, folks need a lot of support to do that. And we certainly need a lot of support to do that at a systems kind of level. 
if we go to the next slide, we're also at a moment where we're having to challenge a lot of assumptions. Um, and we've and we're in part of our kind of world context, certainly our context in this country has kind of dredged up a lot of of uh, those assumptions that we thought were behind us about who our families are, who people of color are, who kids of color are. And so this whole idea of um, what is the role of schools and what is the role of educators um, also has to shift and has to change. Uh, you know, and some of the, what I'll call the old school assumptions really puts a lot of the onus on families. And, and I'll talk a little bit about the dual capacity building framework. Most of you have heard of it and know of it, and that was the topic of the first webinar. Um, but it, it asserts very clearly that the role and the primary responsibility for engaging families really does rest with educators. And so that means that we have to, as educators um, and folks representing those institutions, behave in, in slightly different ways. And so if we think about what that used to look like, schools determine how families and parents are involved, parents' roles are limited. Um, parents can't make a contribution unless they have a specific skill, they're not seen as resources. Um, you know, the, the old school assumption was we just hold a PTA meeting and have parents sign up for committees. Now, some of that still happens. Um, but some of that is insufficient when we think about um, some of the challenges that are being faced. Schools um, have sometimes had an attitude that just hey, just drop off your kids. I got this. Just don't get in my way. We know what's best. Um, especially if you're a family of color and a family in poverty, you can't add much value to this process. So just let us have your child. So some of those kind of old school assumptions, and I won't go through all of these, um, are some of the things that we have to change and we have to move away from. And as we go to the next slide, which looks a little bit more at the newer attitudes around this new school assumptions, is really about seeing all parents and families and caring adults as being able to bring some kind of resource or funds of knowledge, um, being able to bring something to the table, even if it's not coming in a way that we may have expected historically. Um, we see uh, diversity as a strength. We know that we've got to work hard to build trust and build relationships. Um, we've got to help families help their kids at home. And we saw from the earlier research that families had more confidence and more ability to help when we were really specific about that and really worked to make that happen. And of course, um, we've got to collaborate at a deep level if we're going to improve schools. And so that means that we've got to use parents and families as a resource um, and understand that and make them part of the team. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the dual capacity building framework in the next slide. The new version is being written as we speak. We know that the key word is dual. Uh, the second, the other word is capacity. Uh, and the long story short is we improve outcomes for, for children um, by building the capacity of the adults in their lives. And those adults are parents, families, caring adults uh, on the one hand, and then obviously educators and everybody in the institutions that are there to serve our young people. And if we go to the next slide, we talk about the essential conditions to achieve those goals. We've got to build relationships. We've got to have activities that are linked to learning and our asset base, We've got to be culturally responsive, collaborative and interactive. And then from our vantage point, if we go to the next slide, um, which talk, a publication that we released at our conference this year, we really look at, so what does systemic engagement look like? What does it look like when you create the systems and structures that allow and assist um, our teachers, our principals, our other staff, across the districts um, to really build trust, sustain those relationships, employ those strategies, uh, use all of the tools uh, and resources that we've talked about. And you can find uh, this particular publication online. You'll see um, <clears throat> that it was just released this July and it really looks at case studies of a number of district efforts across a variety of, of demographics and, and, and parts of the country probably about 20 or 25 districts total are looked at and, and we examine very closely their systemic efforts at engaging. Um, we put forward uh, a definition 
I've talked a lot about systems and structures. I don't need to say more. In the next slide, what we found when we look at this is what are some of the key elements? We need champions at the district level, at a high level. We need policies. Uh, we need planning and protocols. We need systems of support that are aligned and connected across all of the district's overarching goals. We find that a lot of what's necessary to improve, and you can go to the next slide, to a lot of the strategies that districts are in the midst of, from reducing bias to improving equity, to uh, employing social emotional learning techniques, to reducing chronic absenteeism, uh, to restorative justice. Many of those strategies really require good family engagement to be successful. And so the extent to which districts are really aligned in doing that, um, then we have a chance to make some things happen. Um, just to look at this, this other graphic, um, this is a very fancy, colorful graphic to, to remind us all that leadership matters. <laughs> leadership at every level. Leadership is a driver. Uh, we really can't achieve these goals and we really can't sustain our progress without consistent leadership that leads to better alignment, cross-departmental collaboration, um, and improved outcomes. We'll go to the next, uh, the next slide. I think we've already talked a little bit about high impact strategies, um, one, you know, home visits, and you'll hear about that at, next, at the next, at one of the future um, webinars, you hear a little bit more from parent-teacher home visits and parents as teachers, some of you have heard of, but obviously sharing specific data about kids with families as well as building relationships through home visits and other means really, develops the kind of connection that can improve outcomes for kids. And then the last thing I want to talk about a little bit are about uh, bright spots. And I'm moving quickly here um, in the interest of time. This other slide, um, we'll go back one slide. So we know at the center of all of it is really building relationships and trust and creating the systems and structures that can do that and, and building relationships and structs along with those systems and structures puts us in a position to take advantage of all the tools and resources and to make meaning of, of all of the evidence. So going to the next slide again, um, I just came back from Philadelphia where we looked at what the campaign for grade level reading initiative there is called Read by Fourth. Um, and they've got the six bold ideas and they've got 150 partners as well as the district engaged in this process um, to improve reading on grade level by the end of third grade. And they are really, uh, and you can go to their website, read by fourth, if you do a, a quick Google search, you can get there. And these are the six bold ideas that they've organized around and, and they're beginning to see some results. Um, and it makes some, it, it challenges some of the old assumptions and employs some of the new school assumptions. It really deals with a lot of the systems. Um, and it's going to be the kind of thing that can really help us take it to the next level. So the last slide before we go further, um, I've got a couple of slides there. Um, one is just a repeat of the pictures. The next slide. Um, <clears throat> we really just uh, want to remind folks that our parents and families, despite whatever circumstances, are resilient, creative, eager to be engaged. Um, and we've just got to do, we've got to continue to improve. So we've always got to have a mindset to do a better job at all of that. The next slide just revisits those images. Um, and then my last slide is my contact information it invites you to attend our Family Engagement Conference next year in LA in 2020, and I hope I see, we'll see all of you there. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Ginger and the group so we can keep the conversation going. Thank you so much, Crazy. Um, I am kind of uh, awash in lots and lots of questions myself, and I see that the, the group chat um, has exploded with questions as well. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions that I was thinking hard about uh, with the three presenters in particular able to speak amongst themselves in a way that's a bit blended. And then I will move us on to the chat box questions that have come in. There's some fantastic questions waiting for us. I'm curious, we've identified trust as a major driver in every aspect of parent-teacher partnerships. We've identified, I think, some weak spots, some perception issues, some challenges. If you three presenters, David, Helen, and Kwesi, think about this moment we're in now, 
What do you think is coming down the pike for research and for findings around parent-teacher partnerships in the next 50 years? Just looking ahead in your magic crystal balls. Well, uh, Ginger, I'm happy to kick us off um, on that. I think one of the things that I'm sort of particularly excited about, and I think there's some research there, but there's more that could be done, um, both to pull together what we know and sort of expand our understanding. I alluded to this, but it's actually about the role of students in the parent-teacher partnership. Um, I think they play a huge role. Um, we titled our podcast Notes from the Backpacks. We know those notes from the backpack often get lost. <laughs> um, but they also really shape how families and teachers engage with one another. So that'll be one area I would offer up um, that I think there's some real hope and possibility for in the future. I would, I would second that, absolutely. The student voice is incredibly important part of this conversation. We've done some qualitative and in-depth interviews uh, with, with young people, and it's just been incredibly enlightening, and I think there's so much more that could be done there. The other thing that we're looking at is, um, you know, back to, you know, giving parents uh, an accurate picture of their performance. What happens then? So when parents do have a more uh, accurate and complete parent uh, perception, of how their children are performing, what do they do, what are the behaviors that they employ? I think that's right, and, and, and what I would add, obviously, around the student engagement, um, as kids get older, of course, um, from going from the early grades into, into even middle school and it's certainly high school, you know, the, the role of engagement kind of shifts a little bit. Um, and a lot of that just has to do with what, what's de developmentally appropriate for them as adolescents and, and beyond. Um, and so as they get older in particular, um, engaging the students in the process and helping parents understand how they can support, continue to support that growth with, with a changing landscape becomes critically important. Thank you all. I'm hoping that we'll all be sitting together 50 years from now reflecting on all the things you just said and, and, and posting our progress. Um, in the interest of time and the questions that have come in, I'm going to work my way through most, if not all, of these questions. And please, everybody, keep the questions coming in the chat box um, because I think each of these first some further, more interesting discussion connecting back to some of the larger themes. Um, Christina Katsuratis, I hope I'm saying that right asked a question about um, the poll that you had us take, Helen, about the which of these four items is the most indicative of, I believe it was of success. Um, and it was the, the answer was not one I would have picked, um, uh, requesting a specific teacher, um, which I actually thought at the time was interesting because it suggests and indicates a certain amount of parent engagement already in place if a parent feels empowered enough to advocate for a specific teacher. So I'm wondering if you could say a little more about, um, as Christina had asked, and I was thinking too, why is that the one outline, the one standout amongst the, the slate of options you had given us? Can you give a little more insight about that? Sure. I can give some hypotheses, but I can't give answers. So I think one is sort of as you're alluding to, Ginger, um, and Kristen talked a little bit about this in Tom Boyan's presentation in our last webinar that parents play many roles to support their kids' success. And one of the roles that we know from research is really significant is advocating for their child. So they are learning heroes and partners. They are advocates. They do many, many things. They are coaches for their kids. Um, but that level of advocating um, implies not only that there is some confidence and skill, right, which I think you're getting to, um, but also some potential for systems change, even if on a very small level, right? So I think that's one of the reasons. And I think the other reason, which is not to say those other options didn't play out is really significant with certain demographic groups, but Quasi uh, gave a little bit about this when he talked about the dual capacity framework, is that if we don't set parents up with the tools and information to interact with their child in the school, in a productive way, we can sometimes actually set them up for something harder than if we'd left them alone at all. Um, and I think every parent who's ever tried integrated math with their fourth grader um, would probably <laughs> attest to that. So 
things like reading from home are often structured in a really singular way that assumes a lot of things about parents' own reading levels, language acquisition, et cetera, um, that may make it much more harder for them for the, to support their child's success. So I suspect that's a little bit of what's going on behind that data, and I would put the caveat, I'd love to see more of that in the next 50 years, too, digging into some of that research. Thank you, Helen. And we're going to stay with you, Helen, for a quick question um, from Jennifer Deemer. She was wondering if the citations about research that you had shared were specific to national PTA. No, they are academic researchers out there. Um, there's a lot of great thought leaders. I had the pleasure of just being able to read all the work they did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And try to coalesce it into a story for you all. That's right. That's thank, you for, thank you for doing my homework, Helen. <laughs> we appreciate that. That's a great lift for us. And um, Jennifer Deemer also had a question for David, and her question was, what is considered regular communication with a teacher? You had, re you had referenced that at one point. Can you give yeah, some sense of what- Yeah, that's a good question, and, and I don't have the actual um, survey questions with me at the, at the moment. Um, you can certainly dig that up and, and follow up, but it, it, it basically, it's beyond the parent-teacher conference. So ongoing communication would mean kind of through text and portals and, um, you know, not only the parent-teacher to uh, meetings, but through kind of uh, regular uh, communication through apps or kind of whatever um, um, mode of, of communication is available. Um, so kind of ongoing on a regular basis. Again, I don't have the exact question, but I could, I could look that up and provide it to you. I don't think you can hear me. Um, can you hear me? We can. Sorry. Yeah. I can hear you, oh, but, yeah, but Ginger seemed to have been muted. So oh, okay. I, I was muted. I forgot to push that little button. Apologies. Um, thank you for that, David. Mm -hmm. And I was just yeah. mentioning that Sarah has now put the poll up, and we're encouraging everybody to um, take this poll. It's very short, as you can see, and it gives us a chance to get the feedback we need to keep crafting these GRLR Learning Tuesdays webinars to be as effective as they can be for you all. Um, so please take that poll as we continue on with the questions. Um, and uh, we had a question all, again for you, David, from Hetty Chang, who wanted yeah. to know if you're incorporating explicit attention around what parents can and should be doing to ensure attendance every day in that surround sound approach that you discussed. Yeah, and so specifically in our seasonal campaigns, we've got a lot of, of materials on social emotional um, development. We've got a lot of ma materials on bullying, which can obviously impact uh, attendance. Hetty, I would love to have another conversation with you on um, some tools and resources that you have uh, that we can provide to parents. So we don't specifically have information right now on attendance on our seasonal campaign. Thank you, David. Another one for you, David. Um, we're doing these in order, so obviously the order of the presenters is kind of feeding this. Um, Diane Jones-Lowry wrote that she liked the list of organizations that you mentioned, um, and she was asking if you can provide that comprehensive list that included National Urban League and a whole bunch of others, I think. I'm guessing that we can get that together in the packet for following up uh, from this webinar. Is that yeah, so so we we partner our, our our core partners in all of our research work: National PTA, National Urban League, Unidos US, uh, and Univision. So those are the core partners that we work with all the time. But we have just a ton of partners at the national and the local level that we work to uh, co-brand the seasonal campaigns and other materials. So that list is very, very, very long. Um, and so if you have, if I, I don't know if I can provide it um, to you as part of the follow-up, but if you have questions about a specific organization being on or not on the list, or an organization that you know of that would like to be on the list and like to do co-branded materials with us, would love to, to talk to you about that. Thank you, that's great. Um, Quasi, here's a question for you from Will Marie Citron Tyson from Durham, North Carolina, my colleague. 
Um, she is wondering if you have some strong examples of how service providers can help build parent capacity um, and also what supports are set in place for teachers and schools in places where educators are actually doing home visiting successfully. So you will hear uh, on the home visiting one, I'll answer second, you, and you'll hear that in a, in a webinar that's coming up either next week or sometime soon, but there's a, a great deal of, of research on the benefits of home visiting for both families and for, for educators. And you'll hear specifically about the uh, parent-teacher home visits model. There's a great deal of evidence also um, from the vantage point of parents as teachers, which is in more of the early, early childhood space. Um, and they're part of this campaign as well. And so you, you have access to, the, to that research. If you go to either of those websites, you can find out what that looks like. Um, you know, obviously the extent of the, the time and relationship is different in the different models for in the early years than it is in the later years. Um, but, uh, and there's a lot of work. I mean, there are a lot of organizations um, that are organizing parents and working specifically on parent leadership. Um, and capacity building, not just in terms of understanding what their children are going through, but also in terms of advocating for their own kids and for the kids in their school and in, in their community. And so there are organizations like UPlan, United Parent Leader Action Network, UPlan.org, I believe it's called. Um, there is the um, Dignity in Schools campaign, which does a lot of work with parent leaders and community organizers specifically around school to prison pipeline related issues and the early push out of, of, of young people. Um, there's the National Parent Leadership Institute, uh, which is in a number of communities around the country working specifically uh, tra training parents um, and family members specifically on a range of issues, you know, under the guise of kind of strengthening our democracy. So there's a lot of that kind of work that's taking place. And then in many school districts across the country, um, through either family academies, parent academies, parent universities, they have a lot of different names for these things, but they are offering um, a range of kind of workshop and learning experience as part of their regular process for supporting the families, specific families in their school districts uh, on a range of issues, including, you know, how to support their kids learning. So there's a lot, it's an exciting time in terms of that there's a lot going on at, at, a, lot of, uh, at a lot of levels. Thank Someone you. Someone else asked a question about, about technology as well. Are you get, gonna get to that, Ginger? Because I wanted to say, and, and, and David began to answer that question as well, but I think um, if we think about technology as a resource, there's a lot of it out there. Um, and schools are getting a lot more savvy um, individual teachers, schools, and to some extent districts are getting very savvy at using a lot of uh, a lot of technology from sending daily texts to parents and families to specific tips and portals and all of that kind of thing. Um, I think that the technology itself is not necessarily a substitute for a relationship or building a relationship, but I think that what most folks find that have a lot of these kinds of resources is that after a good relationship has been established, the technology then makes it easier to really provide supports and build on, build on that relationship, that kind of foundation of relationships and trust. Yeah. Yes, that was a question Diane Jones-Lowry had about the role of technology in the classroom and in the environment overall. And I'm, I'm struck by how technology cannot create trust, but it can support trust. Right. And I wanted to do something that David and I talked a little bit about earlier related to that, which is this um, idea that there's some pretty unique challenges we have touched on a little bit, but not a lot here. And one is, I wonder, David, if you speak, and of course, Helen and Quasi, if you have things to add, please do so, to the quality of communication between parents and teachers. Yeah, and I would I would make it a little broader. It's just the quality of communications from schools and districts. Um, it's just mm. a lot of times it's really, really hard for parents to understand and to grasp, and it's not actionable. Um, and what we found through our research that sometimes when parents don't understand a specific concept or a specific word or a specific phrase, 
they make up a definition for themselves, which may or may not be the, the right definition, right? And so a lot of times we've done, you know, specifically in the area of social, emotional, and academic uh, development or developing life skills work and report, um, we, did, we did qualitative and quantitative on kind of how parents perceive um, various words and phrases that we use all the time, like phrases like grit. And parents hear grit. I mean, it's an important concept. It's certainly important for kids to have, but grit sounds negative, right? It sounds dirty, right? It's like a struggle, parents say. Well, try saying taking on challenges and learning from effort, you know? And so another example, and this is kind of funny, but we hear, you know, executive function. And so parents, Say, is that going to the bathroom? <laughs> you know, and so we, we really have their, I could go on and on about, you know, specific examples of words and phrases that parents really don't understand. And so it's, it's critically important, and a lot of teachers do this very well, actually, um, but, but they're still in, in, in communications with parents, whether it's their score report, which I have a hard time understanding when I look at a score report. A lot of times report cards, communications from from schools and districts can be really, really bad. And so we need to make sure that we're making, uh, we're sending out communications that parents can understand and act on. Mm -hmm. If I could um, add a little to that and build off Quasi's point too around technology, I think that um, in addition to sort of the content and language challenges in parent-teacher communication, um, there's some sort of fundamental just process challenges, right? So there's emerging research that shows that, um, you know, things like so many districts are set up in their data portals and other systems as opt-ins as opposed to opt-outs, right? And that prevents a major barrier for many families to be able to access that information. And more so the design um, of how that is all set up is often made more for the teacher and the parent is sort of an afterthought of those systems and the usability of those systems, not really the primary user as the kind of guide of their child's education at home. And then I'd also say um, Helena Dutch and some others from Columbia have done some really great research on turning something as simple as the flyer that goes home, right, like in every classroom <laughs> across America, into something that parents will actually read, respond, and listen to, and little things like how we personalize the invitation, right, how we make it relevant to the child, how we may follow up on that with an are you coming, are you not coming, really do make a big difference. Um, mm -hmm. So not just the language, but I think also there's a lot of room for improvement just in some of the structural elements of parent-teacher communication, too. I think that's right. And I think what's interesting about that conversation, and this is beyond communications on some level, but the, if you think about the hospitality industry, uh, you know, corporations for years have been sending their teams to, to Disney, Disneyland, uh, because they're really good at hospitality. Um, and, if, and, and many of us that shop at any of these places, whether it be food places or department stores or whatever, will notice sometimes begrudgingly that the, the staff greets and they make an effort to make you really feel welcome. And so in some respects, uh, what we do in education has to also kind of take advantage of some of that methodology. You know, there's a lot of emphasis, obviously, on kind of the front office staff and the front facing people that parents and families see when they come into the building uh, be a lot more welcoming. But just across the board, um, uh, you know, communication is a skill, marketing is a, is a you know, these are capacities, um, but also just the attitude of making folks feel welcome um, and appreciated which becomes even tougher in, in these days where you have school shootings and things of that nature, where we've kind of gone backward into a bit of the fortress mentality that was the, discussed in the Beyond, in Beyond the Bake Sale uh, as a way of kind of making the building more safe. And so there's not still not quite enough work, I think, that's been done yet. So how do you keep the building safe from these kind of outside threats while at the same time creating a loving and caring and welcoming environment um, for, for families <laughs> at the community. So that's kind of the next thing we've got to really figure out. I'm not sure we're there yet. Um, 
Um, and I don't know how much research has actually been done yet, Helen, on the, the whole role of a period like this where you've got shootings every day, every week, um, and what role that plays in kind of undermining the welcoming environment of, of schools and in our buildings and institutions. That's tough, um, and those are important thoughts. I'm, I'm wondering, piggybacking on that a little bit, um, if Quasi, Helen and David, you had a magic wand and could just wave it and make something happen. Um, what was, what is the one thing you would each do to make the systems that interact with families more responsive to parents? Is there one thing at the top of your list that would be the thing you'd love to see happen to become the new normal? Wow, I was hoping one of you guys would go first. I, you know, I think uh, <laughs> nobody wants to go, you know, because you, even if, even though conceptually it's a magic wand, you don't want to be completely unrealistic. But um, right. you know, I, I would love for every educator that had the opportunity to do home visits across the cradle to career continuum, uh, and maybe not a home visit, but some kind of a visit where they really had enough time to just really, be, you know, just have a human connection um, and explore, um, you know, as, as parent teacher home business talk about what are your hopes and dreams for your child. Um, mm -hmm. And being able to do something like that, I think, is, is a, a critical first step in building relationships and trust. And if we could have more, more of that, I think we'd be ahead of the game. Yeah, I, I completely agree. The parent, the home visits, um, and we work with Denver Public Schools and have seen the power of the home visits in, in Denver and really in, in, in lots of communities across the country. I would also say really to make sure that educators understand and truly believe that parents are the experts on their own kid and get to know the parent and get to you know, have a conversation about what the child's passions are, you know, what is really exciting to that child. Um, what do they love and what do they don't love? <laughs> you know, what, um, what, what are, what are the, the things that they are excited about every day? And, and learning and understanding that passion working as a team, I think, is critically important. And um, it does, it, unfortunately, it doesn't happen enough for a number of reasons. I, I would agree with both Quissy and David wholeheartedly, and um, at, at the risk of going too far out on a limb, um, if I can speak from the Helen Westmoreland perspective, probably more than the National PTA went on this, I, I, I do think there are some policy implications if this work were really deeply embedded in the job description of teachers. Um, so we'd see it showing up in teacher preparation programs in a really consistent and asset-based way. Um, saying this is the thing that they're least prepared for. They do just as much work with adults um, often as with kids, um, but we've really failed them in that. I think we'd also see the structure of the school day looking a little differently. Um, mm -hmm. So teachers have collaborative planning time to work with their colleagues to do some of this work we've all been talking about on the call today. Um, so it's not just a thing that the, you know, couple of teachers who still have a little gas in the tank at seven o'clock at night, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> do independently and on their own time. Um, while that's important, um, it's not a sustainable model, particularly given the life of educators today um, who are constantly being asked to do more with even less. Um, and then I think we'd also see it sort of showing up in, in our own certification and recognition programs for educators, um, whether that's national board certification in a more meaningful way um, or, or even, um, you know, in teacher leadership development pipelines um, that teachers that are really great at this work are playing leadership roles um, in their buildings, in their districts, in their states. Um, helping their colleagues come along. And I think we do have some great potential partners with our teachers unions. PTA sits at table with the Learning First Alliance with many unions. Um, and they recognize this is what our educators want. We have to make their jobs um, easier, not harder. Um, and so I do think that's going to mean really reorganizing some of how we think about their job um, in a way that's responsive to what, what we're hearing from them um, and what we know is possible with this partnership. 
That's very exciting and, and I wonderful. Have that to that. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you're you're all three reminding me that as we do these webinars, it would be wonderful to see policymakers, legislators, uh, you know, advocates more and more showing up in these conversations because we're out to to recast some systems that are much more inclusive and much more collaborative than perhaps the narrative is let let us lead us to think right now. Um, and I know there are bright spots, and I know that there's a lot of work we can all be doing to be our better selves in creating this space for productive parent-teacher partnerships. Um, I think we are out of time. Uh, I want to thank our amazing presenters, David Park, Helen Westmoreland, and Quasi Rollins for their time, attention, and hard work to prepare for today. It was an exceptional level of, of substance and discourse, and I know I am thinking differently about my work as a result. I want to also thank my colleagues, Suzanne Bell and Sarah Torian for keeping us on track and able to deliver a webinar that had only the glitch of me forgetting to unmute myself at one point. Um, and I'm really excited for the, the archive that we are building together, um, which you can find on CLIP. Um, everybody should be accessing that and taking advantage of this vast, bountiful wealth of resources. You can see on your screen the upcoming webinars. Um, we are taking a break next week in hopes that everybody is enjoying Thanksgiving time with family and friends. But we'll be back two weeks from today at 3 p.m. to do a wonderful conversation with Reach Out and Read um, doing, about the important work that they're doing. Then we're looking at Head Start um, on December 10th, and I will be back um, moderating the discussion on December 17th uh, with the Productive Parent-Teacher Partnership Series continuing. Um, so please sign up for those, everybody. Be sure before you end today, hang up today, that you take that survey. It will help us do the best job we can for you all. And um, and thank you so much, everybody, for your time today. This has been a real treat for me to, to be in this community of people learning alongside these wonderful experts. Farewell and take care. Happy thank you, everyone. everyone.